I welcome everyone to Queen's Park, and it's now time for a question period. The member from Nepean, Carlton. I guess it won't be the member from Nepean, Carlton. Were you standing for an introduction? <laughs> Thank you. The member from the member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My questions are for the acting premier. Over the weekend, we heard from a Liberal Party that is dangerously out of touch with reality. Dangerous. Your premier claimed to offer quote safe hands. Well, those safe hands have delivered one million Ontarians into unemployment. Yes, you can clap for that. Those safe hands signed the cabinet document to pay $1.1 billion to cancel the gas plants. And she's clearly using those safe hands to cover her eyes if she can't see the damage the Liberals have done to the province of Ontario. That's why we put forward a motion calling for the Liberals to table a budget by March 31. First. Will you support our motion or will you continue your budget shell game we exposed last week? I will only ask for uh, statements if I ask for them, please. Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I really do want to start by uh, uh, welcoming Maitland Hutton uh, Hudak to the world. We're, uh, we're very proud uh, to welcome this newest Ontarian. So, <laughs> congratulations to, uh, to Tim and Dad. So, I'm afraid, Speaker, what, what we're witness to here is just another gimmick. Uh, I guess we were coming used to seeing this kind of gimmick from the PCs, especially. Uh, given that every single budget that they introduced was delivered in May or June. Uh, speaker and the Leader of the Opposition sat and applauded each one of those uh, budgets, even the one that was not delivered here in the Legislature. Speaker, We will be coming forward with a budget shortly. It will be an aspirational uh, plan, Answer. Speaker. It will also be a realistic and practical plan. That'll do. Wrap up, please. Speaker, it's a plan that will create security and opportunity for Ontarians. We're not about slashing and burning on the backs of the middle class. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. Yes, we uh, heard last week what aspirational means. You aspire to have a great budget. You just don't know how to get there. Is that your idea of governing? Your minister stands here telling us you've created 400,000 jobs, yet your own documents show us, and I quote, there are fewer jobs relative to our population and more unemployed. These are the facts you don't want us to see. You get caught and your plan is to distract from the fact that you have no plan for the 600,000 men and women who woke up this morning without a job. This is the latest example of the Liberals putting their priorities ahead of the needs of the people of Ontario. It's obvious you don't have a real jobs plan, so use ours. And if you choose not to act at all, stand up and face a confidence vote. Thank you. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, will come to order. Deputy, the member, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, will come to order. Speaker, what I've been able to uh, glean from the uh, jobs plan of the party opposite is their plan to cut jobs, yeah. to slash jobs, to fire nurses, to fire educational workers. Speaker, that is their plan. It's not about creating jobs. It's about slashing and cutting. I can tell you that the, the radical ideas proposed by the party opposite— Member from Northumberland, Quinn the U.S., will come to order. —cut home care to our seniors. It would be on the backs of the middle class, Speaker. That's their position. It is definitely not our no, position. Not our, our position is bu about building our future. It's about supporting the wonderful people we have in Ontario. Speaker, I'm proud of our plan, and I'm afraid of theirs. Answer. Yes. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, you can aspire all you want. I'll pass that message on to the 40 nurses you fired in North Bay already. 
Speaker, last week I exposed the $4.5 billion gap in your budget. Order. Your Premier tried to explain it away by pointing to a potential $5 billion revenue sh shortfall in last fall's economic statement. But that gap was from new spending. And I'm not talking about last fall. I'm talking about what you knew and what you said half a year earlier. In March, you were told by the Ministry of Finance that you were, quote, not on track to meet the 2012 budget deficit targets. Then you went out one month later and told the bond rating agencies, quote, the government is on track to meet the bu budget deficit targets outlined in the 2012 budget. Why did you tell Question. everybody one thing last March when you knew the complete opposite to be true? Thank you. Uh, to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite took six months to read something that we put already out in the public realm. He only now is citing information that is, in fact, as he's just stated, very old. And of course, it's, impro it's important and prudent for any Minister of Finance or any government to react and recalibrate their spending appropriately to the conditions that are facing them. And that's exactly what we've done. The member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex, will withdraw. I'll withdraw. Thank you. Carry on. So we've taken the steps necessary to control and be disciplined in our spending. We were the only government that actually cut spending year over year. Ontario is the lowest cost government in Canada, Mr. Speaker, because of the steps and the initiatives that we've taken. The members opposite are only playing slogans, gimmicks, and they are politics of division. They're creating fear and they're hurting the recovery of this province by the antics that they play. We won't stand for that. The people of Ontario deserve better, Answer. and that is why we're taking the steps that we're doing to protect their interests, Mr. Speaker. New question. From Barry. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Para Pan Am Games. Minister, these games have a higher turnover than your Liberal caucus. This Pan Am Friday, we learned you fired two more TO 2015 executives, but you replaced them with a McGinty staffer renowned for scandal hopping and six figure salaries. Oh, revolving door. Neela Barton shows up in gas plants, Premier Redford scandals, and now wow. Pan Am. Unbelievable. You're in trouble, Minister. You're in big trouble. Tell us how big much the trouble. soft landings for your disgraced executives have cost, plus Neela Barton's homecoming, how much will it all cost Ontario taxpayers? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> you say the you say the Thank you. The Minister of Pan 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 Pira Pan American Games. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker, for the question. A new day, a new attack of the Pan Am game by the member opposite. Speaker, TO 2015 is working in coordination with the, the member from the PN Carlton will come to order. The federal government and 15 oh. municipalities to deliver the best game ever for the Pan and Para Pan American game. Part of TO 2015's mandate is to ensure an efficient and effective delivery of the game that includes staffing, streamlining and organizational changes as deemed appropriate. Speaker, staffing decisions are made by the CEO of TO 2015. The organizing committee is shifting from the planning stage into the operational stage in the lead up to the game. Speaker, recent changes in the management structure were Sir. made by the CEO to reflect this new phrase. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Supplementary. The minister to resign. Let's be clear, Minister. This is not an attack on the Pan Am Games. It's an indictment of your mismanagement of the Pan Am Games. The minister should start handing out medals to executives who actually make it to the end of the games. Wow. It's embarrassing. But it's the taxpayers who have to pay for the endless TO 2015 personnel Order. mistakes. We pay for the sunshine list salaries. We pay for their teas, pets, and parking. We pay for their showing up for work bonuses. We pay for their golden parachutes when they're fired. And now we pay for Neela Barton's Liberal Party loyalty. Wow. Minister, this is shamefully unethical at best. She Will you be step be down and take responsibility for once? Step down. Time to go. Thank you. Please. 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 thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thank you again for the question. Speaker, the member opposite allegations have no credibility. Allow me to give you some examples, Speaker. He told the public he did not know. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order wasn't in the 1.4 billion budget. 
Toronto Star and the Toronto Sun report in 2009, the village cost is outside the TO the 2015 budget. Speaker, he says he's a human resource expert, but has not heard of a completion incentive program. Speaker, he claims security is going to be cost one billion, which he is wrong. He claimed Mr. Service was going to be over a million, which he is wrong again. He publicly claimed our partial reception in October was five times Thank you. the actual cost. Speaker, we are planning the best. Thank game you. Ever. Thank you. Final supplementary. Minister, just so you know, people are watching, so it's about time you start giving some real answers here. here, here, here. Minister, at this rate, sadly, you'll be the only one left standing at the end of this. That is but sad. you know what? In the end, not even your new communications VP will save you. So just so you know, Minister, you hired the only person in Canada who is press secretary to McGuinty and Redford the night they resigned. She's also credited for creating a tanning bed issue to detract from the gas plant scandal. Wow. Taxpayers should not be paying Liberals a premium for spinning scrutiny away from the Pan Am Games mismanagement. Pan Am is not in safe hands, Minister. It's not in safe hands. Neither are you with Neil Barton, by the way. Minister, uh -huh. since you won't resign, do you think you should be the next one fired for the blatant patronage appointment of Neil Barton? Here, here. Seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Outside the House. Speaker, thank you very much again for the question. What people watching every day is the constant attack by the member opposite of the Pan Am game. Speaker, TO 2015 has a mandate to ensure an efficient and effective delivery of the game. That includes staffing, streamlining, and organizational changes. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Is a decision made by the CEO of TO 2015. Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. Continually play politics is an awful shame. The member opposite does not want these games. The member opposite constantly attacks. Member from Cambridge, game. come to order. All his interest is doing is tearing down the game. This is his contribution to the game to continually bad mouthing them and embrace our problems Answer. the world. Shame on you. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. After months of insisting that she was the new leader of a different government, the Premier confirmed this weekend that her backroom advisors have talked to ensure something different. She's no longer going to promise change. She's going to offer Ontario another dose of Dalton McGuinty and proudly defend the Liberal status quo. For people worried about jobs, that means more of the same approach that's left us with unemployment that's above the national average. Does the acting premier really think that this is good enough? Any premier? Well, Speaker, I can tell you that uh, that our premier is uh, demonstrating change every single day. Uh, this is a uh, this is a premier. I, I do have to say, in reference to uh, to our gathering this past weekend, it was an extraordinarily positive, upbeat event, and uh, people from across the province are uh, delighted uh, uh, to be uh, to be supporting such a strong leader. Uh, she has laid out very carefully our uh, six-point plan, Speaker, to uh, create jobs, to, to have a strong economy. She makes a very clear point that. Uh, that having a strong economy is essential to having a fair society, and that's exactly why she is continuing to Answer. come forward on the issues that, uh, that the member opposite used to raise. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin my next part of my question, I want to also congratulate on behalf of the New Democrats, Tim Hudak and Deb Hutton, on the birth of their, their child as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now that the Premier has rediscovered her inner McGinty, she's Minister the of the same Environment, come to order. As, she, as she did, as he did, uh, and they're just about as again. convincing. Not again. Here's the facts that keep Ontario families nervous. One, 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost over the last decade, the highest hydro and auto insurance rates in Canada, and an unemployment rate that's still above the national average. Does the Premier really think it's okay to simply praise the McGinty record and say, Steady as she goes. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I have to say that it's pretty clear that the NDP is a party without a plan, and uh, it is there is no plan, Speaker. There is uh, no plan for uh, pension security. There is no plan for uh, the minimum wage, Speaker. 
And uh, the plan they're putting forward when it comes to the job creator tax credit is simply an unrealistic, impractical plan that would uh, not have the impact that they claim it. So, uh, Speaker, I think that our plan is clear, it's practical, it's achievable, and it's exactly what the province needs right now. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Premier talks about the steady hand she shared with Dalton McGuinty. Let's talk about a decade or over a decade of Liberal rule and what those hands have brought us. Those Liberal hands signed million-dollar bonus checks at Hydro. Those Liberal hands gave a thumbs up to a billion-dollar payout to move a gas plant and to Mr. drive up Hydro. Uh, Those Liberal hands back. waved goodbye to 300,000 manufacturing jobs over the last decade. And those Liberal hands gave breaks to auto insurance companies while leaving drivers with skyrocketing bills. People are hoping for a little better. Why is a Premier suddenly so determined to become Dalton McGuinty 2.0? <laughs> Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Thank Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've created almost 450,000 full-time jobs, full-time jobs since the bottom of the recession. But I have to disagree with the Minister of Health on this because the NDP do have a plan. They have a jobs plan, it's to, and it's to what give it? two billion dollars. That's what finance estimates this will cost for their job creator tax credit, which has been discredited by the Obama administration, by Democrats and Republicans alike. 92 percent in the United States. They found 92 percent of the jobs created through this scheme would have been created anyway, Mr. Speaker, and it's been found that it would be subject to abuse, difficult to administer. So they have a plan. Unfortunately, it's a plan that's going to cost $2 billion. You haven't costed it out, so I'm going to cost it out for you. $2 billion annually, and it's not going to work. Answer. It's going to give money to businesses who are already a member from Trinity jobs. Spadina, come to order. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mergers of the hospital in the Scarborough area. In the Toronto Star, she admitted that hospitals in our entire health care system are facing pressure to the make The member from Eglinton Lawrence, when you sit down in your seat, I'll tell you to stop. We can't provide the home care we want for seniors, and plans for more housing for people with mental health will also be delayed. Can the minister explain what she meant by that? What I can tell you, Speaker, is that our action plan for health care is being implemented across the province. It is resulting in better value for money in our health care system, and most importantly, Speaker, it's resulting in more people getting the right care at the right time and in the right place. When it comes to hospital mergers, Speaker, uh, we, we are not uh, forcing hospitals to merge, but it's certainly clear that there are some advantages if hospital boards decide that that's the direction they want to go. Uh, to, uh, to merge, to, uh, to integrate services, to provide higher quality of care in their community, Speaker. So, we, uh, uh, the, the hospital boards are exploring this. Uh, we're there to support them if, indeed, they decide to move forward with it, Speaker. But my answer remains clear. We must do better when it comes to mental health. We must do better when it comes to uh, improving access to home care, Speaker. We've still got work Thank to you. do, and we're nicely on that path. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, when Ontarians hear their Minister of Health is searching in every corner of our health care system to find savings, they want to know that their frontline health services that they depend on will be protected. And when the minister makes comments about not being able to provide home care or mental health, the concern, they turn to fear. Speaker, in the coming weeks, will Ontarians be learning about promises Minister that the government of made consumer services. will now be broken? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Speaker, I'm, I'm afraid, and it's um, I'm unfortunate that uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the member opposite is taking this quote out of context. What I said, Speaker, that, that because the federal government has cut their funding to the province, that will create real pressures for us here in Ontario. We are committed to continuing our progress on mental health, on care at home. But, Speaker, if the federal government does not accept its responsibility and withdraws funding from, uh, from Ontario, that creates real problems for us. So I would ask the member opposite to join us in our fight uh, with Ottawa. Perhaps she could speak to her federal 
Liberal colleagues to raise this issue to stand up for Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, speakers. While Ontarians understand better than anyone that in tough economic times, every health care dollar must be spent carefully and wisely. That is why the government's change choice to encourage such thing as private scheme for health care, cuts to nursing services, or their refusal to cap CEO salary makes no sense to them. Speaker, will the minister come clean with Ontarians about whether her comments are actually warning signs of the budget to come? Thank you. Minister. Uh, speaker, let me underline, we are uh, we are implementing our action plan for health care. It means more care for people in their own homes. It means better supports for people facing mental health challenges. Could we move more quickly with federal support? Absolutely right. Am I signaling any cutbacks? No, I am not, Speaker. You can rest assured. I want to also underline 20,500 more nurses are working today than 10 years ago. Speaker, let me repeat that. 20,500 more nurses are working now than a year ago. 4,000 more this year than last year. Speaker, we are shifting. We are not cutting. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. It's an accepted fact in Ontario today that the Green Energy Act has been an abysmal failure, but don't take my word for it. Take the 81 municipalities who've declared themselves not willing hosts, or the Auditor General who said for every job the Green Energy Act creates, four are lost, or the Energy Minister himself who said he spent $20 billion to produce 1.1 per cent of power. But the final nail in the coffin comes today as we do not meet our WTO obligations for international law because of your government's domestic content rules and your generous subsidies. We will not meet international law obligations obligations today, Speaker, even though they have known about it for four years. They have been told to correct it in the last year. We want to know on this Question. side, enough's enough. Will the minister cut our losses with this Green Energy Act and finally repeal it? Thank you. Uh, you see it, please? Please, thank you, Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we've already taken the preliminary steps to ensure that Ontario is in compliance with the WTO ru ruling, and if passed, Bill 153 would complete that process and would save Ontario ratepayers 1.9 billion dollars, Speaker. Billion. I think it's important that we take a look at what the PC energy plan is, Speaker. Yeah. It's a very, very frightening plan. $35 billion would go back to ratepayers under this plan. It would add a massive cost to energy bills, $35 billion, cost Ontario jobs and drive away potential investment. Speaker, they want the to cancel $20 billion dollars worth of unconnected clean energy projects, putting ratepayers on the hook for cancellation costs. That's $20 billion. Another $15 Answer. billion dollars they want to spend on new nuclear that we don't need and will send rates sky high. Thank I think you. they need to look again. I appreciate that the Acting Premier isn't abreast of the file that she's carrying today on behalf of the Energy Minister, um, but I'm, I'm wondering, does she want to create a trade war in Ontario that are going to create uh, more job losses in her province and come at a significant disadvantage to Ontario uh, commodities? I also wonder if the pre Deputy Premier is excited about damaging Canada's international reputation uh, within the World Trade Organization. As I stated, the government has known for four years that they were breaking international law. They have known for a year now that they had to redress this and they had to become compliant by March 24, 2014, which is today. So if the compelling job losses, if the compelling evidence of job losses, municipal unrest, and uh, their, their plan just not working, it doesn't influence them to do the right thing and to cut the Green Energy Act loose, Question. perhaps complying with international law will do that. So I ask again, will the Liberals do the right thing? Will they Thank break with the Green Energy Act, and will they repeal it? Thank you. Deputy Premier. 
Uh, speaker, the, the member opposite, I believe, already knows, but I need to remind her that the uh, domestic requirements in the FIT program were always intended to be temporary while our Ontario industry was established. Now, Speaker, I'm very pleased that Ontario's clean energy manufacturing uh, sector is best in class. We're able to compete on a global level, and I'm seeing that happening in my own community in London. Speaker. She should also know, if she doesn't already, that at least 85 per cent of Ontario's domestic clean energy jobs will not be impacted by the reduction in domestic content rules. But what these changes do is they continue our government's commitment to clean, affordable energy, in stark contrast to the PC plan, which is what—and I'll quote the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. He had to say this last January. We've been cleared. We'll not be going ahead with however many projects are left. Clearly, there'll be a cost associated with it. I guess we're not going to know what that is the entire extent un unless we form government. Answer. So, Speaker, it's reckless. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Your question, Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Acting Premier. On this side of the House, we've been clear on the sort of changes that we need to see. We can start by fixing the mess in our electricity system. U.S. jurisdictions are literally taking our electricity at a third of the cost that we pay to generate it and using the subsidy to lure our manufacturing to the United States. And to add insult to injury, municipalities in upstate New York are now targeting business in Ontario with a promise of lower electricity rates. Why is the acting premier defending the same McGuinty Liberal status quo that's driving up electricity prices and driving business out of Ontario. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Um, saving money for the business. Well, uh, just as an aside, Speaker, uh, last year our exporting of electricity actually reduced costs to consumers by $300 million. The NDP wants to put us out of that business. That is a reckless approach, Speaker. We are, though, very concerned about hydro costs for small businesses, Speaker. Yeah. This is a serious issue, and it's yeah. one we're taking seriously and appropriately. Yeah. We are saving businesses money on hydro bills. As of 2013, under the Industrial Electricity Incentive, eligible companies qualify for electricity rates that are among the lowest in North America, Speaker, in exchange for creating new jobs and bringing new investment to the province. Speaker, the uh, Industrial Conservation Initiative is helping large Sir. consumers save on costs by incenting them to shift their electricity consumption to off-peak hours. Speaker, it's working. Thank you. It, Thank I you. could go on. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians paid a billion dollars for that $300 million worth of electricity we sold. Families and businesses across Ontario have been saying that skyrocketing hydro bills are making it harder than ever to meet their budgets, and it's making it harder for Ontario businesses to grow. We've put forward a practical solution. Manitoba and Quebec sell their electricity into the same U.S. markets as we do for 50 per cent more. Wow. That's because they cut out the middleman and sign long-term contracts that get the best export price. The acting premier and our energy minister are defending a status quo that is sending discount power to the United States, while our bills are expected to go up another 40 per cent. Question. Does the premier see a problem with this, or does she think things are perfectly fine? Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, of, of course, our, um, our concern for people who are paying uh, high energy prices is is, is real, Speaker, because their problems are real, and that's why we've taken action to reduce the price. Speaker, the NDP has one plank, and one plank only, that I've been able to find on their energy plan, and that's $100 off. Speaker, the National Post said that proposal veers straight into crazy talk. So it shows that the NDP does not National have a realistic Post plan. When it comes to, to export, Speaker, the National Post says those who claim that Ontario subsidizes electricity, electricity exports fail to understand both economics and how the Ontario electricity sector actually works, Speaker. So 
Uh, we uh, we agree that this is a challenge for people. We know that. We hear that. We feel it. We have a plan, Speaker, to address it. The NDP Thank you. simply does not. New question, the member from Scarborough Thank right, you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Ontarians all remember the tainted blood scandals of the 1980s. About 30,000 Canadians were infected with HIV and hepatitis C tainted blood and blood products. Thousands also die. Since then, maintaining the integrity of our blood system has been of utmost importance to all Canadians. That system is built around the voluntary donations, and yet private for-profit companies setting up clinics in Ontario where people will be paid for donating blood plasma. Speaker, to you to the Minister, can she please inform the House what she's doing to address this threat to our blood system? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Scarborough Asian Court for this important, very timely question. I know many Ontarians are deeply concerned about a private for-profit company uh, plans to, play blood, to pay blood plasma donors and sell that plasma to an international market. I wrote to the Federal Minister of Health a year ago to express those concerns, and unfortunately, Health Canada has been unwilling to take leadership on this issue, so our government is. As a first step, we've enacted regulatory changes that would prohibit any licensed lab or specimen collection centre from paying for blood or plasma donations. And last week, I introduced legislation that would, if passed, go a step further by making it an offence to offer to pay donors for blood or for individu individuals to accept payment. This is an important yes, piece sir. of legislation, Speaker. I understand that members on both sides uh, support it. I really am calling on both parties to commit to passing this legislation as soon as possible. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I'm pleased to hear that our government is addressing the serious uh, health issues. However, media reports indicate that one of the clinics opened up last week and has been accepting donors. Not only does this action undermine Ontarians' confidence in the integrity of our national blood and blood product system, it also poses a real health risk to the system. Speaker, to you to the Minister, can she please also to inform the House how she plans to stop this clinic from paying donors? for blood plasma. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, I have been very clear with the operators of this clinic from day one that what they've proposed is unacceptable and that they would require a license to operate in Ontario. I did not, I would not, I will not approve a license for any lab or clinic that would undermine our voluntary blood donor system. Bravo. Speaker, the operators opened their clinic anyway. Last week, we sent in observers to monitor the clinic's activities, and based on what they found, we have investigated an inspection of the facility. If the, laboratory, if the company chooses to undertake activities governed by the Laboratory and Specimen Collection Centre Licensing Act without a license, I will take every action necessary to ensure they That's comply good. with the law. And to ensure that paid donations do not undermine our voluntary donation system, Answer. we must pass Bill 178 as quickly as possible. Again, I'm calling on all members, please do not hold up this bill. Thank you. The question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, you will know that London and area have been hard hit with recent plant closing announced at Heinz, Kellogg's, Worthington Cylinders and Westcast Industries. In fact, a recent Ivy School of Business report says that London has lost one-third of its manufacturing jobs in the last the eight years. Member from and Lawrence, However, come to order. despite the ongoing job losses, we also know that London police wage hikes have outpaced inflation by 32 per cent over the past decade, and now two-thirds of London's professional firefighters are now making over now making more than $100,000 per year. <clears throat> Deputy Premier, with literally thousands and thousands of jobs being lost in the City of London, why do you think these pay increases for police and firefighters are sustainable for taxpayers Question. who pay the bills? Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, I, I really want to speak to the economic situation in southwest Ontario that the member opposite referred to. And I tell you, I have had the, the great pleasure of attending events where new investors are coming to southwestern Ontario, hiring people who otherwise would not have had that opportunity. This is happening through the Southwest Ontario Development Fund, which, shockingly, the member opposite voted against. 
These are investments that are making a difference. I will refer the supplementary speaker, but I do want an answer from the member opposite. Why didn't you support your own community? Why didn't you support businesses in your own riding to create the jobs we so desperately need? Thank you, supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that was uh, quite an answer, but back to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, only about half of the working age population in the City of London even has a full-time job, but yet London's police and fire departments continue to add more and more employees to the list of those earning over $100,000 per year. Sounds like London's it. Sunshine List shows 239 London professional firefighters are now making over $100,000 per year. That's more than double the number a year ago. Minor Deputy volunteers. Premier, this is unsustainable. There are hundreds of public sector employees in the City of London that are now making over $100,000 per year, including 107 different City Hall managers, 192 police officers and 239 firefighters. Deputy Premier, with so many London residents currently out of will your government answer our PC call and immediately implement an across-the-board two-year public sector wage freeze and fix Ontario's broken Thank you. arbitration system? Thank you. Clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Deputy Premier. But to the Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I, I don't know what the uh, member opposite uh, is uh, is referring to, but we on this side of the House, Speaker, are grateful to the work that our first responders do every single day. We're thankful to our police officers. We're thankful to our firefighters. We're thankful to our paramedics and every single public servant who continues to serve. Our, our hard-working Ontarians, uh, Speaker, this is this is Speaker coming from a party who wants to fire teachers, who will have to fire nurses in the future, like just they have done that in the past under the government of Mike Harris. Speaker, we reject the refuse, uh, we refuse that proposition, and we also reject the proposition of right to work for less type of policy, Speaker, that is going to drive wages down, that is going to result in a loss of benefits for hard-working Ontarians and loss of jobs, Speaker. That is not the direction we want to go. In, and we refuse our, uh, uh, that notion. Thank you very much. Your question, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for Pan Parapan American Games. Speaker, the first casualty of the Pan Am TO 2015 was Ian Troop, CEO, who got an extraordinary severance. Now we have the firing of two more TO 2015 executives. Presum presumably with yet another set of fat cat severances. These recent firings expose the dangerous instability at TO 2015. Speaker, with such extraordinary instability at the helm of TO 2015 Parapan Games, how can Ontarians have the assurance that we will be ready and on budget for the Games? Minister responsible for the Par Pan Parapan Games. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, speaker, the, all the capital costs and also the uh, capital, uh, capital for the Pan Am game, they are on budget, under budget, and in advance of the time. I just want to make sure the member opposite know. Speaker, uh, this is changing the management team at TO 2015. Speaker, the decision was made by the CEO, Mr. Ravi. The organization committee's mandate is to ensure an effective and efficient games delivery. I am confident in Mr. Ravi's decisions to streamline the organization as he sees fit. Yeah. Today, the committee has been able to bring in all capital projects on budget. They are all Master. going to be completed well before the game next year. Speaker, their performance so far has been great, and I look forward to more updates on game process progress. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, I hear they want to aspire, but with answers like that, you might expire. <laughs> Speaker, uh, Ontarians are quite concerned about the one degree of separation between the board, the cabinet minister, and the new CEO of 2015. And now the appointment of Neela Barton, yet another well-known, connected liberal insider, is drawing a lot more concern. Couple these disturbing connections with their possible sweetheart severance deals with the serious concerns about rising security costs and the lack of transportation plans, it's no wonder Ontarians are worried. Speaker, 
Will this minister finally clear up the murky mess that bubbles to the surface almost weekly in TO 2015, or will this chaos continue? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, the member opposite talk about the management of the game, and let's talk about the management of the game. Speaker, the management of the organizing committee has most recently found saving of $49 million. The operating budget now decreased from $1.441 billion to $1.392 billion. Speaker, the management of the games is effective and cost saving. I am confident Mr. Rafi's decision for the good of TO 2015 and the games. Speaker, again, all the member opposite is interested in is tearing down the game in any way possible. They do not want the game to come to Toronto. They do not want the game to come to Ontario. They do not want our athletes to leave their dream to compete in the game. Speaker, yes, sir. they can contribute to bad mouth the game, but we are preparing for the best games ever. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, recently I introduced Bill 116. The Manoranjana Kanasabapati Act. This was legislation dedicated in honor of a resident who was killed by a distracted driver. In recent years, our government introduced distracted driving laws to keep drivers safe. However, distracted driving is still a major issue on our roads. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to see the Minister of Transportation introduce stricter laws with Bill 173 last week. True you to the minister, can you please explain the enhancement to distracted driving laws that you introduced in Bill 173? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Matter of fact, the bill that was uh, introduced last week was really the work of the member for Scarborough Rouge River, and, uh, and I'll talk about this a little later. It was one of four private members' bills that found expression in this, and I want to thank him for his leadership. Uh, and uh, for his concern for public safety, because all Ontarians are benefiting uh, from this legislation, which we hope will see passage in the House soon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this law will allow justices to increase fines. We're setting a minimum of $300 to a maximum of $1,000, as the member act, uh, asked for. Mr. Speaker, he also lobbied very heavily that uh, demor demerit points uh, should be increased. As a matter of fact, the MPP for Scarborough River, Rouge River suggested that three. Uh, Demerit points, like as with impaired driving, should also be. And uh, yes, I'm happy to report to him uh, that his effort has been successful, and that will be the actions taken by the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I know for a fact that most, to most Ontarians, are supportive of the measures to make roads safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers alike. Yet, still, Speaker, we see. Way too many drivers taking risks and still using handheld devices while driving. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the Minister to speak to what other changes are included in Bill 173 that will aim to keep drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians safe, and also why we should all work together to get this piece of legislation passed as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Well, the reasons are. Uh, are pretty significant. Uh, distracted driving now exceeds drink, drunken driving as the leading cause of accidents in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Just this past year, we have seen 78 deaths from distracted driving, Mr. Speaker, and that compares with 57 deaths from impaired driving and 44 deaths from speed speeding. Uh, almost twice as many as from speeding. So this has become the serious biggest uh, killer of people on our roads, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but we need passage of this bill, and we've tried to do it. And the other measures actually reflect uh, the work of other members. And I, I do want to just again thank the member uh, for Simcoe North, who did the move, uh, move and pull over to uh, uh, end fatalities and make road safety. The member for Perry Sound Muskoka on shoulders and cycling, and the member for Parkdale High Park for the one meter rule. Mr. Speaker, I think this is our bill as a House, and I hope we'll pass it. Thank you. Thank you. No question. The member from Memphis, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation as well. Minister, during the break week, you visit.
of my riding and met with a delegation of the County of Renfrew to discuss the four laning of Highway 17 through to Renfrew. The implication you made coming out of that meeting was that somehow this project is being held up because of a lack of support from opposition and from myself as the local representative. Minister, I've been committed to this project since you were still the mayor of Winnipeg. <laughs> Successive transportation ministers have complimented me on my advocacy. In fact, you did so yourself in a meeting with county officials and myself last fall. Minister, I say it's a priority. You say it's a priority. Why don't you exercise the power that you have, stop passing the buck, and ensure that this is in the, trans the next five-year transportation plan? Will you do it? Thank you. You see the face? You see the face? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, I did commend the member for his advocacy when I was in his constituency. What I said was this. This project, the first phase, which just opened uh, in November of 2012, all the way to Arm Priory, has shown our commitment, and I know the member advocated for it as well. That was $75 million that this government committed to twitting that highway. Mr. Speaker, what I was asking is if the member would join myself and other members along the four the 17 and the 400 highway because the federal government's commitment for the entire pro province of Ontario next year not just for highways for schools water everything is only 73 million dollars mr speaker as you know our government's investment in the 417 was 75 million that's 2 million dollars from this government for that one project that Answer. the government of canada will spend in this entire province next year mr wow. speaker i was looking for his leadership in getting Ms. gallant and others to get the federal government to match Thank you. so we can complete this project supplementary minister you always seem to have someone else to blame yes he does one minute it's us the opposition yeah. the next minute it's the federal government yes, it is. as far as the federal government is concerned that would be helpful however you don't seem to need you don't seem to need their help in implementing a pension plan no. that is going to take tens of millions of tens sure. of millions of dollars out of our economy each and every year. Yeah. As far as the opposition is concerned, you, you seem to think that we're the ones that Mr. control finance come to order. Who moves forward or not? You Mr. didn't Mr. Finance. Us with your e-health scandal. Nope. In case he didn't hear me while he was yelling, Minister of Finance will come to order. Thank you. Finish, please. You didn't consult us with your e-health scandal. You didn't consult us when you implemented the HST. You didn't consult us about the power plant calculation, one billion dollar project. If you want my commitment, it's been there for ten years. Question. And here it is once again. I'm absolutely, totally committed to this. Are you? Because as Mr. Firestone says, this is where the rubber meets the road. Hear, hear. You. you see it, please. You see it, please. Minister of Transportation. Thanks, thanks. Mr. Speaker, what I was trying to invite was a partnership with the member of the opposition to try and get Ms. Gallant to the table, yeah, his federal member. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say this very slowly so I'm understood. Mr. Speaker, this government, the government of Kathleen Wynne, has spent $75 million already twinning that highway to Armprior. Our government is continued to we are working to fund it all the way to Renfrew and eventually to Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, we spend $3 billion a year on highways. We're not making excuses. When the member opposite was in government, their entire budget for everything was $1.4 billion. Our entire budget for everything is $14 billion. Mr. Speaker, right now, Answer. next year, the federal government will only spend $73 million for water, sewers, schools, roads and highways. That will not even extend the highway to Renfrew. We need them Thank to be you. serious partners, Mr. Speaker. They are not. Thank you. No question. The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism. Uh, Mr. Minister, last week I raised a very distressing issue in the Legislature. The biggest jazz festival in the entire province learned that it did not qualify for, for Celebrate Ontario grant for this year, 2014. Lido Chilali of the Beaches Jazz Festival said that without this money, which they have received, by the way, for the last seven years, 
drastic musical cuts will have to be made. Both the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development assured me that they would look into this wrong-headed decision. My question to you, Mr. Minister, will the Minister do the right thing and reverse the devastating cut to the Beaches Jazz Festival funding? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for the, uh, for the question. And, uh, the member knows uh, last week I actually walked across the floor and uh, told him that uh, uh, I have contacted or outreach to the organization uh, regarding this uh, particular funding. Uh, uh, Speaker, the Minister of the Environment Ontario is a competitive pro uh, program and uh, the funding is all exhausted, but I, we do have other programs in my ministry that's uh, what we are prepared to, to talk to the organization so that we can come up with uh, ways and means to help them. And uh, I have advised that the member opposite. I'm surprised that he brought up the question today. Thank you. Supplementary. I brought the question up because if they don't know what funding they have by the end of this month, they're going to have to cancel three of the four stages. That's why I'm asking today. Mr. Speaker, the Beaches Jazz Festival is open and accessible to everyone. It is free to the public. It supports young and emerging musical talent, and it is world-renowned. Alvo Fest which is taking place in Toronto on August the 3rd and 4th, reportedly sold $9 million worth of tickets in 48 hours, but your ministry, uh, your ministry gave them $300,000. Wow. Even the tiny Markham Jazz Festival in your own wow. riding uh, wow. Wow. is receiving the grant. Music festivals across the province are getting help from Celebrate Ontario, but the biggest, the best, and free of charge in the showcase for new talent is receiving nothing from Ontario. Will this minister reverse this direction and support the Beaches Jazz Festival and do it today before the event is cancelled? Thank you. You're right. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, I just heard my uh, honourable colleague talk about uh, there's a lot of festivals and events happening every year in Ontario, and our Celebrate Ontario program is a highly competitive uh, program. This year, we received 441 applications, requesting more than 34 million in funding. Wow. And as you know, uh, Speaker, that uh, the funding we available is about. 20 million. Okay. Of the 229 successful applicants, 129, more than half, were in both opposition and third party writings. Wow. To say the program plays favoritism is simply ridiculous. Wow. Speaker, it's time for the member opposite to stop playing politics with Ontario's wonderful festivals and events. It insults all the applicants Answer. and the organization. Thank you, Speaker. To a new question, a member from Ottawa, Orleans. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. As a member from Ottawa, I understand the importance of mining not just for the North, but for the entire province. In 2013, the value of mineral production in Ontario was $9.8 billion, up from $6.3 billion in 2009. This industry has an economic impact on the entire province. That is an increase of over 50 percent, I think 57 percent, in only four years. I'm proud of our government's success at helping, helping to foster this important industry. For instance, Ontario is among the top 10 mineral investment jurisdictions in the world. As a result, 24 new mines have opened here over the last 10 years. That's more than anywhere else in Canada. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Northern Development Mines please educate this House on any new Ontario mine openings? Thank you, Minister Norton, Development and Mines. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And he's certainly right. The uh, mining industry has enormous benefits uh, for the entire province, certainly not just Northern Ontario. And when a new mine opens, it's, uh, it has an immensely positive impact on the regional economy, and every community surrounding it shares in those benefits. That's why certainly Premier Wynne and I were so pleased to be uh, up uh, in Greater Sudbury on February 21st at the uh, official opening of the. Uh, of the Totten Mine, Valet's first new mine in the Sudbury Basin in over 40 years, and we were joined by a number of other members of the legislature as well because it's such a huge event. The project itself created over 500 construction jobs and now is employing over 200 uh, area residents. Uh, this is a great story and really a positive piece of news. It's worth talking about the safety record as well, may I say, of this Answer. mine. During construction, it was exemplary, achieving over 1 million person hours with 
on a lost time injury. Thank you. Just a great project, Mr. Speaker. Great to be Supplementary. Here. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to thank the minister for that update, and he is right. Dutton's employment and safety record is impressive. I'm very pleased to hear about both the economic benefit and the safety record of this new Valley Mine. I know that this government and the minister are also concerned with community engagement and environment effects, environment effects of the mining industry. That is why our government has modernized our legislation so that First Nation consultation is one of the first steps in the mining sequence. Since the beginning of the abandoned mines re rehabilitation program, Ontario has undertaken rehabilitation on 80 mines, demonstrating our commitment to environmental stewardship. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is community engagement and environmental protections ensured in the operations of the new mines in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Again, I thank the member for Ottawa Orleans for the question, and, and, and it's just really as an example of how the mining industry has changed so Im immensely, Mr. Speaker. I mean, uh, this, the, the, the leadership of that mine, they're demonstrating leadership in both uh, community engagement and environmental stewardship. They've utilized some of the best technology, automation, and environmental management in the, in the mining industry. So it's one of the the Totten Mine is one of the most environmentally friendliest mines in the province. Want to congratulate Valet, obviously, but also Chief uh, Paul Eshkakigan, I believe is how you pronounce it, from the Sagamot Anishinaabeg First Nation, signing an impact benefit agreement. I mean, this is a, a game proactive and a beneficial type of community engagement, very much supporting the approach taken by our government when we modernize the, uh, the Mining Act. First Nation Aboriginal Conservation yes, is one of the first steps in the mining sequence. This is a tremendous uh, project, great economic benefits, great social benefits, and one should sure all be very proud of. Thank, Thank you. you. New question? The member from Simcoe North. Thank you. Thank you. My question today is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, today we have in the Members Gallery a young hairstylist by the name of Kaylin Ambrose. Kaylin finished her hairstylist apprenticeship and she has a loyal group of customers who believe she is an excellent hair, hairstylist. Yeah. Repeatedly, she has tried unsuccessfully to pass the written exam. She's tried the exam six times and has spent over $800 without success. Wow. She now is classified as a journey person candidate. On April the 8th, the first anniversary of your boondoggle Ontario College of Trades, her time is up. She either passes the exam or, according to a, a letter signed by, by your five directors, and I have a copy right here, she no longer can practice hairdressing. In other words, Mr. Speaker, she's out of work. There are another 4,300 apprenticeship candidates in Kay like Kaylin, according to the Ontario College of Trades website. Question. Minister, are you prepared to see this tragedy happen to so many people just like, because they are not have trouble passing a written exam? Minister, let's bring some common sense to this place. Tell Kaylin she can continue working and building a career for herself. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the hairstylists that are here today. Welcome to Queen's Park. Welcome. Thank you for being here, and I'm delighted you're here because it gives me an opportunity through the Speaker to address this issue uh, with you and compare our approach to the approach opposite. Mr. Speaker, we believe in you as tradespeople, as skilled tradespeople, who are more than capable of making decisions for yourself. Yeah. So the decisions governing your sector ought not to be made by politicians like they want to do, but be made by the sector itself, Order. by tradespeople, in a, in a form, form, form of self-government. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that that hairdressers, Mr. Speaker, hairstylists, and all tradespeople deserve to be protected. They've gone to school. They've gone through apprenticeships. They deserve to have their jobs protected, Mr. Speaker, from the underground economy, which is what the College of Trades does. That party over there, Mr. Speaker, does not believe in that. So we'll continue to stand up for skilled Thank tradespeople you. in this process. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you. That, this is not some answer. It's not pathetic. Well, with Kaylin today are other hairstylists and business people who have started the Ontario Hairstylists Association. They have also started the Cut the Salon Tax campaign. And, Mr. Speaker, every hair salon in Ontario is going to hear about the Cut the Hair Tax Salon, okay? You can be sure that's going to happen because they're going to get to you over through this Ontario College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, you know, the one thing we've got going for us is we're not puppets here on this side of the House for Pat Dillon and the Working Families Coalition, like that crew over there. We can't take this any longer. The people of Ontario deserve better Minister. than people like that representing them on Cabinet. I will never be a puppet for a Pat Dillon type of person. You are, Mr. Speaker. Try to explain yourself why you're not a Pat Dillon puppet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to work with tradespeople across this province to ensure that they can have their own voice so decisions that impact their trades are not made in smoky back rooms. At Stop the clock, please. <laughs> the, the member from Simcoe North asked the question, and I think you want to hear the answer. And if you don't want to hear the answer, I don't want anyone speaking while I'm speaking. And the member from Oakville, I don't need your support. Member from Halton, come to order. <laughs> Finish, please. The difference, Mr. Speaker, between us and them is we believe skilled tradespeople in this province are. The, uh, the, the, the member from uh, Simcoe North will withdraw. The member from Simcoe North will withdraw. Absolutely not. Well, I will never withdraw for a comment like that. The member from Simcoe North will withdraw. The member from Simcoe North is named. I uh, order, please. While there was noise, the member from Simcoe North was named. You have 10 seconds. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to stand up for tradespeople across this province. We're going to continue to ensure that those, these, those hardworking people go through apprenticeships, that they're going to be protected from the underground economy. We're going to stand up for consumers. Thank you. And we believe, Mr. Speaker, thank that you. the government himself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Cameron LaFam is a young man with autism who lives in Hamilton with his parents, Marilyn and Serge. He attends an excellent high school program that meets his needs and allows his parents to work. But at the end of June, Cameron will be aged out of school. He could attend a day program, but his family barely receives one third of the cost of this program. The family doesn't need a spot on the passport funding wait list. They need increased support. Speaker, will the minister commit to providing Cameron with the support he needs before the end of the school year? Mr. Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, as uh, the member opposite uh, surely knows, I'm uh, not in a position personally or legally to get into answering specific questions about specific cases. I would suggest uh, to the member opposite that if she would like to sit down uh, with me and talk about her situation uh, or with my parliamentary assistant, I don't know if this is the same situation you uh, were talking about, we'd be delighted to, uh, to have that conversation and to see uh, not only what uh, might be provided, but also to bring the member up to speed in terms of how she accesses services on behalf of her uh, her constituents, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And, and back to the minister. No, minister, it's not the same case. It's a different case, as there is a different case happening every day. Better supports for persons with disabilities and their families is desperately needed. Waiting lists are not the answers. No one can put their life on hold while they're waiting for a decision from this ministry. Every young person will be aged out of school, and developmental services knows exactly when this is going to happen, and they should be prepared. Yet this transition continues to occur and throw families into turmoil. Speaker, to the minister, instead of properly supporting persons with developmental disabilities as their needs change, why does this government choose to leave Ontario families in the lurch and force them to fight for more support? Mr. Speaker, I don't disagree with much of what the member opposite has said. We all have a responsibility in this place to put in place the kinds of supports for those in our developmental services sector and their families who are having challenges. The member opposite did speak with me in passing about a specific case last week, which I assured, assured her we would work on. She hasn't unfortunately spoken to me about this until just now. If she'd like to do that, I'd be pleased to offer whatever help I can. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.